You Thanks for sharing that with us. Yeah. Well, Judy's kind of close hold on all that stuff, so you don't need to talk about it to anybody. But I did want to sure. tell you uh -huh. I had it had upset our schedule. So uh, anyway, and I don't mind you praying for her. <laughs> so, uh, and she doesn't either, but she won't ask you. That's right. Anything else going on that you need to uh, speak of? Mm. <laughs> okay, our uh, text this week was one of all of our favorites from John chapter 3, and as I looked at the devotions I picked out, I did not select this because of the text reading. When I went through and selected a devotional for every day of Lent, this was uh, third or fourth on my list, and it, but it does have something to do with the reading today, so maybe somebody else had a hand in that. Uh, <laughs> And it's, uh, the title of it is uh, Objects of Divine Love, and it's from his book on the problem of pain. And Lewis wrote, when Christianity says that God loves man, it means that God loves man. Not that he has some disinterested, because really indifferent, concern for our welfare, but that in awful and surprising truth, we are the objects of his love. You ask for a loving God, you have one. The great spirit you so lightly invoke, the Lord of terrible aspect is present. Not a senile benevolence that drowsily wishes you to be happy in your own way. Not the cold philanthropy, 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 I'll get that right in a minute, of a conscientious magistrate, nor the care of a host who feels responsible for the comfort of his guest but the consuming fire himself, the love that made the world, persistent as the artist's love for his work, despotic as a man's love for a dog, provident and venerable as a father's love for a child, jealous, inexorable, exacting as love between the sexes. How this should be, I do not know. We were made not primarily that we may love God, though we were made for that too, but that God may love us, that we may become objects in which divine love may rest well pleased. To ask that God's love should be content with us as we are is to ask God to seek to be God, because he is what he is. His love <laughs> must, in the nature of things, be impeded and repelled by certain stains in our present character. I didn't read that right. His love must in the nature of things be impeded and repelled by certain stains in our present character. And because he already loves us, he must labor to make us lovable, that he can reconcile himself to our present iniquities. And The Problem of Pain is a great book. Uh, if you haven't ever heard of it or read it. Of course, it is a problem. How does God, why does God allow such pain in the world or in some people's context cause it? Mm. That's our devotion for today. Um, our first prayer is um, uh, not quite ancient, but uh, several years old from April of 2000. So let's pray. Hundreds of years ago, dear God, before Christ, Jeremiah promised in your name, they would write on our hearts a new covenant. And we pray you will write, this heart belongs to God. This heart loves God. This heart loves neighbors. This heart loves self. This heart loves justice, light, and life. We pray you will write, this heart is humble. Be not proud. This heart is courageous, fear not. This heart is forgiving, judge not. This heart is thankful, praise God. And write this reminder. This heart is to beat with joy in the breast of this child of God. It is to beat all its days the rhythm of an eternal anthem of peace. Amen.
and I don't know who has a Bible handy uh, that has uh, can flip to Psalm 130 real quick. First one over wins. I have it. Go. Go. Gain to speedball. From the depths of despair, O oh Lord, I call for your help. Hear my cry, O oh Lord. Pay attention to my prayer. Lord, if you kept a record of our sins, who, O oh Lord, could ever survive? But you offer forgiveness that we might learn to fear you. I'm counting on the Lord. Yes, I'm counting on him. I have put my hope in his word. I long for the Lord more than centuries long for the dawn, yet more than centuries long for the dawn. O oh, Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is unfailing love. His redemption overflows. He himself will redeem Israel from every kind of sin. Thank you. That's one of the 15 Psalms of Ascents. Okay, our scripture reading, well known to everybody, favorite of most, John 3, 14 to 21. Betty, have you, I'm not Betty, I was going to get uh, Mary involved here. Have you got your Bible handy there, Mary? You're muted. You're muted. Down the lower left hand corner. Hi, there we all. Oh, there How's you go. That? Okay, can you read? Can you read for us John 3 14 to 21. Okay, coming up. John 3. All right, 14 through 21. All right, let me find 14. There we go. All right. Okay, John 3. Let's see. Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can somebody be born when they are told? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the spirit, fresh Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to the spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind, where, oops, the wind <laughs> blows whether it wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone who's born of the spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are an Israel leader, said Jesus. And you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimonies. I have spoken to you earthly things and you do not believe. How then can you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the son of man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten, his only one and son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe in believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in his name of God, one and only son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Uh, everyone who does evil hates the light and will come into the light for the fear that they will be seen plainly. That's what they have done, has done, has been done in the sight of God. Thank you. I, I was confused there for a minute, but I think maybe the Spirit moved us to read this in context, uh, to include those first 13 verses. Uh, that was good. I, I <laughs> didn't interrupt you. Well, that's right. <laughs> well, oh, that's great. Well, I got that. I read the whole context. Yeah. <laughs> 
the uh, I thought uh, maybe you were in the wrong chapter, but then suddenly you were in the right chapter. So we were just getting the proper context. You got the whole story. I like it or not, it's your story, George. Well, you should have stopped me and told me I was at the wrong one. It's uh, it's what I had on my list to talk about next is context. And as Jim knows, I love to try to get things in context. And I gave you an extra piece of paper this week called Themes of the Lenten Scriptures. Uh, and it's one of the things that uh, I've been trying to do for this uh, Lenten study is uh, open eyes, uh, remind us to be open-minded about uh, different things in the text and remind that we need to study the text. And what we study this year may lead us to understanding something different from what we read three years ago. So this thing of paper that I sent you, Themes of Lenten Scriptures, uh, I listed there what the lectionary readings are for every the five weeks. And then I listed what the upper room, that's a different context. If you have uh, our Sunday school group, which is just uh, Jim and Mary Alice and Betty, uses this book as a text and has a devotional reading for every day. And then they come from the lectionary. But every week, the devotions are written by a different person. And so what we see when we read that or study it is uh, a context. They have picked a context. And you can see in those upper room things, they give a title or a theme to each week that these individual writers have written. And um, they are not put together unless the writer actually stops and thinks, I am writing this, say, in the fourth week of Lent. And it's in the context of Lent that I write it. Uh, but they probably have not seen the writings of the first four weeks because they're all different people in different parts of the country and they're sending them into the editor in Nashville. And uh, so they're independent. They're all in the same context. They are not the same context. So if you had that book and you study that, you get a different flavor to it. And I do have some extra books. I buy these to give away. So uh, if any of you, Bob and Carol and uh, uh, Jean, do you have one of these? Okay, uh, if you want one, uh, I will send it to you. If not, why, uh, just, you know, let me know. Uh, but uh, uh, Giselle, do you need one of these? Wait, you're muted, but you can let me know at any time. I've got uh, three copies I can give away. Anyway, that's there. a separate context, a way to look at things. Uh, the second column in that thing I sent you, and you may be at a disadvantage if you didn't print this out from the uh, uh, email I sent you. Uh, the, second, the third column is uh, Burton's sermon series for Lent. And I've labeled it Obum series. And his series is titled How to Follow Jesus. And so each title for each week has a colon after how to follow Jesus, and then a specialized talent, like how to follow Jesus through baptism, how to follow Jesus, the cost, how to follow Jesus, turning things upside down, and that was last week. This week it's how to follow Jesus to save the world, and then how to follow Jesus dying to live. And then the fourth view of the Lenten series is this some of the sermons that I have sent you and uh, given to you uh, on Thursday morning. Uh, the first one was, remember your baptism. Uh, and second one was the uh, one entitled obituary. Last week was remember the Sabbath. And then this week it's uh, titled 316. Now you had another one, I have to confess, I sent you another one. I didn't have actually two sermons from antiquity on uh, this week. I don't know why, uh, but I sent you one that was a continuation from last week. It was still on the Exodus reading about the Ten Commandments. And uh, 
So this week uh, you'll get one entitled 316. And next week it'll be Some Greeks, uh, which is one of my favorites. Jim will maybe know why I gave this Some Greek ones at Dee's Chapel. That was an African-American church up in uh, north of Atlantic on the Eastern Shore. One of my dear friends was the pastor there. So that'll be next week. Okay, so those are the contexts. And, you, you know, there are other contexts that you can see, too, uh, looking at things. I, I had said a week ago, I wasn't certain when I gave you that obituary, when, whether or not I was uh, subliminally moved to talk about that dying in that way whether I'd been influenced because I'd done a couple funerals in that same time period. And I went back and looked at my old record and yes, I did. I had two sermons or two uh, funerals uh, right before that Sunday. So it probably uh, was an influence that I wasn't even aware of. Maybe I was that the congregation needed something like that at that time. I, I don't know, now it's lost, but um, so that's a, uh, one of the purposes of this week or what one of my goals was in this week. Oh yeah, there's a second page to that list of themes that goes into the sixth week, uh, gets us into Palm Sunday and Easter. So uh, it might help for you to print that out and kind of follow along on that as we go through the next couple of weeks. So uh, you can see from the, I already told you the title of the sermon. In fact, I think it's printed there in the, the agenda. It's 316. So I focused in this reading, there's a whole lot in there uh, on th just that one verse. Uh, and well, that's the main focus, but you can't do that without doing uh, more context than that. Um, one of the contexts that I also thought of this week, and I went back and checked in my records, because uh, I don't know, I think it came up in our Sunday school about uh, choosing themes or topics. Um, the reading last week was about the cleansing the temple. And I had noted that I had never preached on that text. Uh, and I looked at the reading in that upper room thing and the authors don't say this is so, but I'm guessing that they pick the one they think is the most important for that week and put it on Sunday. Because they've got seven days and they've got four texts and they give three of the texts two days and one of them one day, something like that. And uh, so they get to write about all four, but I think there's a focus on Sunday. And the uh, commentator this year did not choose the uh, John reading about cleansing the temple. And I thought, well, is that common? You know, uh, so I went back and looked at the old leper room disciplines. I have a whole shelf of them dating back into the nineties. And uh, that's not always true. A bunch of the commentators did use the cleansing the temple as their Sunday thing, but not all of them. Many of them used the Ten Commandments. So that was uh, a context uh, of, you know, that my congregation on the Eastern Shore, by this, by this time that this happened, uh, would have had, uh, you know, a lot of Sundays with me. And so they would have had an inclination of my leanings and uh, my theology and uh, maybe quirks or strange things about me, but uh, that you don't necessarily have, though you have a certain knowledge of me they don't have because you know me in a different way in Sunday school and I uh, church worship where I'm not the pastor. Um, but looking back on the uh, sermons, of course, you know, Matthew, Mark, and Luke all have a year where they are the dominant theme in the lectionary readings, the gospel theme. And John doesn't have a year, 
But when you count up the lectionary readings, John has more than anybody else. Uh, John's the mainstay of Easter week and Advent and Lent, uh, and he gets those uh, Sundays every year, not just in one year. Uh, so uh, my, my inclination is to preach on the gospel. But uh, in the course of things, I realized I was doing that, and I thought, well, I'm going to start preaching on Paul. And I did, you know, took the lectionary and used it for several Sundays in a row. And uh, I didn't like doing that. I'll have to talk about that another time. But I'm more comfortable with the gospel than with Paul. And I think it's because Paul is so contemporary to his time that he forces me to be absolutely contemporary here, which is nothing wrong with. You should understand contemporary. But it sometimes seemed false. And it sometimes seemed uh, very opinionated, um, on my opinion. And I wasn't comfortable with that. Uh, so anyway, I did not stay with Paul for you know, more than one year. And so uh, the epistles in general have less than any of the gospel, uh, except if you include Acts. So uh, also there was another strain uh, I decided I was going to do Old Testament. I did Old Testament for some 20 weeks in a row. Uh, and my Old Testament bent is about uh, equal to the any of the gospel. Just, uh, Genesis and Exodus together would be uh, the equal of Mark. Which, you know, you expect Luke is longer. Uh, maybe you should have more readings from Luke. And Mark is the shortest, so maybe you have the fewest from Mark. But um, those are uh, viewpoints that come up naturally in studying the Bible uh, because the lectionary is written by people who have selected what's important, what tells the story, and tried to tell it over a three-year period. So... Um, that's the bias. I also decided I was studying over time and I kept reading how important the Psalms are from various people, Martin Luther and uh, John Wesley and John Calvin and Diedrich Bonhoeffer. And, you know, uh, and it occurred to me that we have these little testaments that he pass out to children at different times and soldiers going off to war. And it's the... Uh, New Testament with Psalms. And you have to wonder, okay, why the Psalms? And so I go back to the comments of Luther and some of these folks and say, uh, yeah, I, I need to study Psalms. The problem is not in the Psalms, it's in me, that I don't have this uh, connection that these other saints of the church have had and do not value them in the same way. And in the process of doing that, I ended up preaching on the Psalms a good bit. And uh, they have become more important to me over time. And so you can see uh, that if you had access to my roster of preachings, you might notice this slow evolution to uh, bending toward the Psalms frequently. Uh, and I always like the... Uh, traditional liturgy in the church where you read three of the scriptures and some churches read all four uh, every Sunday. Uh, it is inconvenient for some people because uh, it takes more time and you're late getting out. You can't beat the Baptist to the uh, uh, restaurant for Sunday dinner. Uh, that, you know, that's a real problem. <laughs> I mean, that, uh, uh, in the country, you know, the people uh, often go out to uh, Wright's or the place over on Chincoteague uh, to eat, and uh, there's a good crowd on Sunday afternoon, and so uh, you want to get out on time, and uh, so reading three scriptures is uh, a burden to some people, but it never was to me. Uh, 
And I always thought that if people didn't like my sermon, at least they had two other readings they could uh, meditate on while I was uh, talking. Uh, or they could take a nap. That's one of Jim's stories about the old farmer sitting on the front row taking a nap. It was only a moment of rest he got all week. So uh, anyway, I, that's a long-winded uh, dissertation on context and how it happens and how it encourages us to study. That was one of the quotes in the sermon last week about from Willimon, I think, about why we have Sunday school and Bible study uh, and preaching and singing and praying is to remind us constantly of what the Bible says and then to open our eyes to what more it says. All right, uh, when I went to from the Eastern Shore to Knoxville to Asbury, my, one of my first duties there was in the community and the three churches had joined together and we did vacation Bible school. And uh, apparently it had been the task of my little church for the pastor to tell a Bible story to the kids every day of the vacation Bible school. And so I would take, you know, different age groups through the day. Nine o'clock I'd do one and 10 o'clock another and 11 o'clock another. And uh, same story, but uh, different age group. About two weeks after I'd got finished with vacation Bible school, one of the uh, traditional stories of vacation Bible school uh, and children's Sunday school is Zacchaeus. And they can all learn to sing the song. You can all sing it. Oh, you know, Zacchaeus was a wee little man. Uh, and I was, that was the text for Sunday. And I got to looking at it and it occurred to me that many people our age, or older even, have uh, been reading the Bible for 30, 40, 50 years, but their approach to some of the stories is like a 10 year old in VBS. And so it became a challenge to tell the stories in an adult way uh, with more uh, more, well, I'm searching for the right word, as you can tell, uh, more depth to them, more meaning, uh, and more significance in an adult life than Zacchaeus climbing a tree. Uh, so uh, that, that's why I think these Bible studies are important and why it's important to read them uh, independently and out loud uh, or listen to somebody else read them out loud and hear a different inflection that gives a different meaning or you will suddenly see a different meaning. So I think what we're doing is important. And uh, I have to confess, I'm enjoying so much and going back and looking at these old sermons and saying, hmm, that's not bad. <laughs> uh, and I, I could be wrong, but uh, I, I'm really enjoying it. So uh, I'm... I've talked a long time. What I know this is a, a favorite of many of you. So this John 3, 14 to 21. What did anything jump out new at any of you? That you're what I call mature readers, thinkers, theologians, Christians, disciples. I'm gonna be quiet. I'll break my rule. You do have to push the unmute button if you want to speak. If you don't speak, you have to listen to a sermon. If you don't speak, I'll assume you're eager to hear a sermon. Lord, may the words of my mouth, the meditations of all our hearts, be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer.
few years ago, my granddaughter Anna called me. She asked if I knew what March the 14th was. And I had to confess I did not know what she was talking about. And she told me it was Pi Day. And as a school contest, she had memorized Pi to 175 decimal places. That's a wow. We generally say pi is 3.14. It's really, to you mathematicians, a never-ending decimal. It means it's irrational number. It can't be expressed in terms of a ratio, a fraction. It just keeps going. We said it, generally say pi is 3.14, but it's really never-ending. And our reading today in John begins with 314 or 314 and goes to 321. But numbers are all around us. Maybe you've seen on TV, it's football games, people holding up a sign. It says 316. That's all it says. And numbers are all around us. At that time, that was several years ago, on TV there was a program called Numbers. And this uh, mathematician, uh, mathematical genius professor, brother was an FBI agent. And uh, the guy with the numbers was always helping him solve problems by using some mathematical uh, trick. And I know one of my favorite games is uh, Sudoku. Maybe you've played it, it's a, a number game. I assume it's Japanese from the name. There was another TV program on called 24. And that was a 24 hour uh, program that went for an hour at a time for 24 weeks. And that was a good program and that was about numbers. We know about 911, we know about 911, 711, and we do know pi. We also know that there is a book of numbers in the Bible. In fact, Numbers was a reading this week. Now, one of my favorite stories, some of you heard it, is a quote, I, I forget now, I should have looked it up. It said, music is a trick that math plays on the ears. That is, middle C, I think it's 256 cycles per second. And the next C up is twice that, 512. The first C down from that's half of that. So it's a put to harmony together with those notes. You have to have some kind of harmonic between the notes. They have to be harmonious. Uh, so that's where music is a trick that math plays on the ears. Well, last spring, this was in 2009, I was at a meeting of... 13, 30 Christian men, dedicated men, serious men, and it was a get acquainted meeting. And we were excited. Most of us had been to something like this before. We knew we were going on a great adventure. We were going to share God with others, with each other, for four hours every Friday night for seven weeks. And then, when we were prepared, we would spend three days sharing our experiences of God with these, each other, these 30, and with 30 other men. And we were preparing to take these men on a short theological walk, short walking trip, the six miles from Jerusalem to Emmaus, called the walk to Emmaus. Well, because we didn't all know each other, there was a, a get acquainted hour that first night, and each man was asked to pick out a favorite Bible verse, and then to tell the verse, what it, the verse was, and explain why it was a favorite. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, one man was eager to go first, so no one would use his favorite before him. <laughs> But there was no rule against uh, using repeats, but that he wanted to get in there. 
There was, of course, some variety, but no rules about repeat. But one of the first choices, his first choice was, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Well, before it was over, several others did choose John 3.16, and they gave different reasons. Some others said they would also have picked it, but since it had been chosen by somebody ahead of them, they picked another. And as I listened, I thought this was an easy verse to choose, no controversy. But that would have been unfair. These were serious, mature men who had thought a lot about God and the Bible. And they were not looking for an easy answer. They were looking for meaning and depth and truth. They were not like some boys I remember when I was young in a Baptist Sunday school over 60 years ago, when in the large gathering in Sunday school of all the age groups at once, the adult leader would ask, go around the room and everybody had to recite a Bible verse. And uh, after that, we'd break up into age groups and gender groups. And uh, there was a couple of boys who were really eager to jump up and get the first verse. Because in that setting, you could not repeat another's verse. And the boy wanted to jump up and say, Jesus wept. That's an easy one. It's the shortest one in the Bible. Uh, but these men were not trying to take the easy way out. Well, I didn't pick John 3.16, but it got me thinking. I wondered, why is this maybe the most popular verse, maybe the most recognized verse in the Christian Bible? This week, our lectionary text, John 3.14 to 21, includes John 3.16. Now, there is a lot in this text, but I was stuck on 316. Could it be that this is important because this is the verse that brings people to Jesus, to God, to salvation? How can that be right when the Gospels were written, according to C.S. Lewis, and he might be wrong, he says the Gospels were written for believers. They were not written to convert skeptics, persuade doubters, or convince atheists. But that is exactly what they do sometimes. Maybe it is a miracle of God that the gospel, written to remind believers, and incomplete as they are, leaving unanswered questions as they do, can and in the end do, convert non-believers. Nothing in John 3.16 is persuasive, argumentative. Doesn't prove anything. It states a fact. You either accept as true or reject as nonsense. These men were saying, this is true. This is what I believe. They were saying, this is important. Now, some things are true but irrelevant. John 3.16 is both true and irrelevant. And relevant. But if the Bible wasn't written to convince, then why do the Gideons give away millions of Bibles? Did you ever ask or think what an act of faith that is? They will put a Bible in every motel and hospital room in the world and have faith that someone someday will come to that motel room or hospital room and pick that book up and read it and believe it and their lives will be changed. This is an act of faith because the Bible was written for believers. And it is such a hodgepodge of books. And it is such an incredible story. Who could be convinced by a few verses? And yet, the Gideons can recite story after story of people 
reaching into that nightstand in a lonely room in a strange city, taking that King James, Gideon, King James Bible, opening it up to some random place and reading and changing their lives. People have been saved. People who were ready to commit suicide, who went to that motel room with a gun. And some people are not ready to kill their body in an act of suicide, but they seem to be committing spiritual suicide every day. But how can it be that these ancient words change people? Well, one answer is that the Holy Spirit speaks to us of hope, and our lives seem hopeless. Another answer, no less mysterious, mysterious, I heard not long ago. This is a little strange. Man said, we are all born with the memory of the Garden of Eden. I like that. I can't prove it or explain it, but it fits another notion I have. I think I got it from Jim. We're all born with a God-shaped hole in our soul. We are incomplete and won't be satisfied until we find what will fill it. We may try substitutes, but only God will do. Most people who pick up a Gideon Bible have heard of God or Christianity. Most people who have that void, that hole in their soul also have had a seed of faith planted in them at some time in the past. May have been a grandparent silently reading a Bible or an evangelist shouting on TV or a kind old lady down the street speaking softly. It may have been someone they mocked, jeered, or laughed at. They knew people who believed all this Bible nonsense were fools. All this hocus pocus about God and heaven and love and all that wishful foolishness. They knew there were fools out there filled with hope. Truth is, we all need to believe, even if we don't know we need to, and even if we don't know what to believe in. That hole is a hunger that yearns to be filled. And this verse 16 leads to the next one, 17. Indeed, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. And these two verses, 16 and 17, are a creed of the Christian belief. The words summarize not only the gospel of John, but the essence of Christianity. The creed says... I believe in God the Father Almighty, and I am one of those fools who have hope. And I believe that God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Even in parts of the world where there has never been a missionary. People feel that gnawing hunger and that hole inside, and they have invented something, a God or many gods, to try to fill it. Paul had no problem preaching a new God to the Greeks and Romans. They already believed in many gods. What was one more to them? The hard part was getting them to give up all the others. Today, I think it can be harder because it's a different problem. Because so many people today start out believing in no gods. They have idols, but no gods. God so loved the world, makes several important creedal statements. First, there is at least one God. Second, he is a God of love. He loves all the world, not just the children of Abraham. Are you one of those fools that believe that? That he gave his only son asserts that God has a son and only one son. 
The Apostles' Creed says that too. I am one of those fools that believe that. So that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. We believe that too. We believe it because of the Easter story. John offers no proof. He doesn't explain why God, lo God loves us or why he wants to save us. It's just stated as a fact. You believe or you don't. You may be like many others. You wish it were true, but you're afraid it isn't. That motel room Bible is offering a window of hope to have heard there is light and who wish for light outside the dark dungeon their lives seem to be. They don't believe it. They have spent their lives making fun of it, but they wish it could be true. We don't read that God so loved the Israelites that he sent Moses to save them from Pharaoh. Or that God so loved the Israelites that he sent David to save them from the Philistines. We read, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that the world through him might be saved. That's what we believe. Mm -hmm. In the hospital room, in pain and fear, God uses his megaphone to call us. Fred Craddock says that God almost always speaks in a whisper. Mm -hmm. You remember Fred, he's one of my favorites. He always speaks in a whisper so we can have a choice. Yes, if God shouted at you, you would not have a choice. God whispers so you can use your free will. He wants you to choose to love him. He will keep reminding you, but he won't force you. He won't raise his voice above a whisper. You will have to listen. But C.S. Lewis, you know, another of my favorites, helps us out a little in understanding and getting the whisper. He says we have a hard time hearing God's voice when our lives are going well. When we are in pain, we hear better. And he says it is if God has picked up a megaphone. He's still whispering, but we hear better. People who choose as their favorite verse, John 3.16, have been there. They have had enough pain, and they have heard God's whisper. It may just have been the pain of realizing how very bad they are, what they deserve if they receive justice and that they might receive mercy from a loving and forgiving God. This is the verse for those who have discovered how close they have come to losing eternity. What does it mean to you if you don't feel this verse is important to you personally? Maybe it means you haven't realized yet how much God you need God in your life. Maybe you have not known yet enough pain. Maybe you haven't really heard him whispering your name. You know, there's a challenge here too. Do we sow seeds everywhere, even though it is clear that some of the hearers of our testimony are very rocky soil? Do we take this message, this creed, and carry it to non-believers? Do we plant a seed of faith in them by saying, I believe that God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that whoever believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. Also, do we water the seeds others have planted by saying, I believe God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but in order that the world might be saved through him. Do we believe? Do you believe? Do we tell others? Do you tell others? Amen.
occurred to me while I was reading that, that uh, Mary Johnson and I walked at, walked to Emmaus once together. Uh, she was the uh, rector, and I've forgotten the number now, uh, 140 something? 140, what was it, really? 143, I think, something like that. 142, okay. 32, something like that. Yeah, that uh, was a great walk. I don't know how many of you have been on the walk to Emmaus, but it's, uh, there's three, okay, four hands. Got you, I see you all. Uh, it's, I, I don't know, if, if you've made the walk, have you also teamed? Because you know, no. it may be surprising to you, but teaming is better than walking. <laughs> you, you, I, my theory is that you, when you're walking, you learn to receive God's love. Mm -hmm. It's a very hard lesson to take what others give you but when you walk you learn to give hmm. and, i mean when you lead you know you're not taking the walk you're teaming uh leading the walk uh, that's when you learn to give more thoroughly it's it's a wonderful experience uh i've done five and uh several chrysalis and one uh kairos which is prison uh, ministry so those walks are important. That's an aside, uh, not necessary to the sermon topic or the text topic. Last minute comments, uh, insights, surprises before the benediction. You're running out of time, Jim. Yeah, I was just going to comment quickly, as, as quick as I can, on 316. I, um, I have blamed that verse many times for my being a United Methodist. When I, when I went to, uh, to UVA, to the, school, to the Department of Religious Studies, and be, became and started my, my studies there, my first professor was a fellow named Harry Gamble, and he was interviewing all of us, and and he said, what are you going to do? And I said, well, my plan is to get my bachelor's degree and to, uh, and to go to seminary. I feel like I've been called to ministry. And he said, okay. Uh, and he asked me more about my background. He found out that I, found out that I grew up in the, in the Presbyterian church. And he said, which, uh, which way are you going to go? Because uh, at, that, at that point, I was married to a woman who was a United Methodist, and, and uh, I was under the wing of a Methodist preacher who was a friend of mine for, for years. And uh, he said, which, which way are you going to go, Presbyterian or Methodist? And I said, well, I really haven't made that decision yet. I'm still thinking about that. And, uh, and he said, okay, your first paper, I want you to write uh, a paper about the theology of John Wesley. And so uh, Dr. Gamble started me out thinking about, uh, about the Methodist church in that way. And what did it for me was that see, being raised in the Presbyterian church, that's a kind of Scottish Calvinism. And one of the tenets of Calvinism is double predestination, which is to say that uh, there's out of a hundred people, there's a certain percentage that are predestined to go to heaven. Uh, and I, I, I can handle that. But what I couldn't deal with was the idea that there was a certain percentage that were predestined to go to hell. And the uh, you know, double predestination was something that Presbyterians, I can, I can remember as a child hearing that talked about. So I knew it was a part of the Presbyterian way. And I couldn't push uh, pre, the doctrine of predestination past John 3.16, because John 3.16 says, whoever. You know, there's a, there's a that, that word whoever is a wide open word, whoever believes. So it doesn't, so there was a, that text says that there's no, that there's nobody who can't be, who's predestined to go to hell and can't be saved. Uh, and so that made me, pay more attention to the teaching of Wesley and sort of drift away from my Presbyterian upbringing 
into the United Methodist Church. But I blame John 3.16 for that because I couldn't abide the, the notion that there was somebody who was created to go to hell. <laughs> I just couldn't, that, that, that just got stuck in my craw, so to speak. So, but that, it was John 3.16 that did that to me. That just opens a window for me or a door or something. Uh, once upon a time when you were pastor here, there was a confirmation class. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think you sent all these people out with a list of questions to ask their mentors. Yes. And I was a mentor to a young man. And so we came to our first meeting and he pulled out his list. And his first question is, why are you a Methodist? And so I wonder if that was put in his, uh, on his list by you. Uh, uh, no, no, not that, not that particular question. Yeah. Anyway, I hadn't thought about that, why I was a Methodist. Uh, but I, and my quick answer was, well, the Methodist church permits me to be wrong. <laughs> you know, I, they have a lot of tolerance and a lot of uh, range of beliefs. And uh, even if they think I'm wrong, they will give me grace enough and time enough to come back to what's right. Yeah. Or, you know, and so I'm not sure that's a bad answer. No. Uh, I think there's a different uh, probably measure for the clergy than for laity, but at the right. time, I was laity, so I can get away with saying that. Uh -huh. You know, Ron, I wonder if this verse, it says, God so loved the world. If he can love everybody, no matter who they are, what they've done, where they're at. And if we believe in this, then right. that's what we're supposed to do. And in our society today, it certainly isn't being done like I feel, I, like I feel that it should be done. Say so. Say no so. No matter what, what, who they are, where they are, what they've done, you know, that's, uh, he loves us that much. When you think about the love that he gives us, it's so much love that we obviously have to give it away and to give it away to anybody. Yes. Just to love them or say something to them. Yeah. And so that's what that brings to me every time I read it or hear it. I think, oh, I need to say hi to the Asian person. I need to say, hey, I don't understand what you're what you're what you went through, but I'm willing to listen so that I can learn and know how to approach other people. I think that has a lot more meaning for for us than I mean, it's a good meaning that we are saved and we're going. But I think we can do more with that if we really believe it. Yeah. Thank you. Well, welcome, Bill. You have to unmute if you want to talk. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I had to find it. <laughs> yeah. We did. Uh, I think yeah, that... you missed most of the uh, class. I'm sorry about that. Well, found that black mold in the basement. <laughs> oh no okay that's not good well the, the problem is i don't i don't know where the water is coming from mm -hmm. i have no experience on that now as far as the mold i can handle that because i was always doing mold inspections up at fort belvoir i was an industrial hygienist you know up there in the, in the hospital and that was my cup of tea and belvoir is loaded with mold so we were always doing a mold abatement, but uh, where the water comes from, I can't tell you. <laughs> nice. Okay. So, that, so that's, what's, that's what has us worried now. Okay. Well, we'll see you next week. And next week, we'll, as far as I'm knowing, I'm, I think we will be. I'm pretty sure. Judy doesn't have any more appointments set up. We'll be back on Thursday uh, at 11. Okay. And, uh, I will send you out uh, materials probably Sunday afternoon or Monday morning. And uh, I was going to say, I look forward to your information. Yeah. And God willing, we'll be here. The way right. things are going around here, we've had water problems too. I mean, it's just one thing after another. Yeah. Yeah. A wet time of year. No, I'm right. 
I will see you all next week. So here are this blessing or prayer. Uh, I want to say a word about these prayers. These were prayers that uh, uh, I was pushed into by Jim because uh, <laughs> I was uh, asked to be a, a lay pastor. And under Jim's reign, while we uh, lay pastor did the invocation at the beginning of the service. And I'd never prayed in public before, so I started writing a prayer every week. And we were using that same upper room disciplines as our Sunday school book. And so I had the lectionary, and Jim was a lectionary preacher. And so I would write a prayer for every week. Now, I didn't uh, do the invocation every week because we had eight lay pastors. But uh, anyway, that's where these prayers came from. And this one is from February 21st, 1999. So let us pray. Our Father who art in heaven, you taught us to pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. We confess we are tempted, not as Christ was tempted, to turn stones into bread, but as Adam was tempted to test the rules of living. We have not sinned as David sinned, but we have been tempted as David was tempted. We have looked across this sanctuary in your house, at one of your beautiful children and forgotten for an instant the words we pledge before you and witnesses. We have forgotten just for a moment the person to whom we vowed to forsake all others. Yes, we have been tempted. This is a forgiveness prayer. Each of us must pray in our private closet where we retreat to beg you for forgiveness. We give thanks for that forgiveness, which we are assured we will receive, but which we are warned we will receive only as we give. Amen. Amen. And the reason for giving you that history is to acknowledge that these prayers I wrote ended up not being invocations so much as songs. Uh, some thought and communication with God, but not uh, invoking God so much. And so maybe that was my real introduction and into curiosity and uh, pursuit and study of songs back in those very early days. So uh, goodbye all. Thanks for being here. And I'll see you next Thursday. Thank you. Thanks, Ron. Thank you. Good Everybody. Lord willing and the creek don't rise. <laughs> <laughs> And we got your picture at last, Betty. Yeah. Yeah, I know. There I am. Here well, you should are. we stick around? <laughs> I'm, I'm just, well, my, I came on a while ago and said my connection was bad. I guess there's too much sunshine. <laughs> oh, <laughs> breaking my heart. <laughs> Love you guys. Bye. Bye. Love you too. Bye, Bye Bill. I'm still there. I thought I was hanging up. There we go.